Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Friends, happy Easter and welcome to our time of worship. Whether you're joining us from your home online, perhaps with family and friends getting ready to feast today, or maybe you're listening to us at Super Talk FM, however and wherever you're joining us, today is a great day as we celebrate the good news that Jesus is risen from the dead. Welcome to worship. Drive the nails in my hands Laugh at me where you stand Go ahead and say it isn't me The day will come when you will see For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people. Christ 
is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Would you join me in our affirmation of faith with the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus, for our sake you died Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the
Friends, today is one of those days where it's easy to see how our giving makes an impact in others' lives. Because of your generosity, we're able to worship. We're able to gather both in person and online and over radio. And we are able to share the good news that Jesus is alive. And we're able to share that with the world. So thank you for your generosity that empowers us to do this on this important day. And I want to encourage you to continue to give that we might continue to share the message of Jesus with the world. You can give right now safely and securely online at firstmethodistclinton.org slash giving. You can mail your check to 100 Mount Salus Road here in Clinton or just drop it by the church the next time you're in the neighborhood. However you give, thank you for your generosity. And don't ever forget, it makes an eternal difference. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you're joining us today. I'm Miss Nikki, and we're going to have a few moments for the kids. Happy Easter! How many of you plan to have an Easter egg hunt? I brought my Easter basket with me today. As you can see, it's all ready to go. When I was a kid, we used real eggs, which we decorated ourselves. I think some people might still do that, but most people probably use plastic eggs like these. Usually there's a piece of candy or maybe a small toy inside. The eggs here in my Easter basket are very special because each of them will teach us something that will show us exactly what Easter really means. Inside this first egg is a cross. And the cross reminds me that Jesus willingly carried his cross to Calvary to die for my sins. No one told him he had to carry it himself, but he did it because he knew that was the only way that we would ever get to heaven. God loved each one of us so much that he sent his only son so we could have everlasting life. Inside the second egg here, I have three nails. These remind me that Jesus was nailed to the cross. The nails they used to put Jesus on the cross weren't little like these. They were probably more like this size. They were pretty big. He suffered a great amount of pain as the nails were driven into his hands and his feet. He suffered that pain to pay for the price of our sins. Inside this third egg, I have a stone. And the Bible tells us that after Jesus died, they placed his body in a tomb and put a huge stone over the entrance. On Sunday morning, two women, both of them were named Mary, went to see the tomb but the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was open. And the stone reminds us that even a huge stone could not keep Jesus in the grave. And that brings me to the fourth egg. This fourth egg is empty. And the Bible tells us that when two, the two women went inside the tomb, it was empty because Jesus was not there. At first, the woman thought that someone had stolen the body of Jesus, but inside the tomb was an angel who told them, he is not here. He is risen, just as he said he would. Come, see the place where he lay. And the empty egg reminds us that Jesus' tomb is empty. He is risen, just like he promised. So the items inside these eggs remind us that Jesus willingly took up his cross, but he could not be held to the cross by the nails, and he could not be kept in the tomb by a stone. He is bigger than all of that. He is risen and lives in heaven with God the Father. And the Bible tells us that everyone who believes in him will join him in heaven with God. And that's the good news for today. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your only son Jesus to die for our sins. We are thankful that his story does not end with his death, but that he is the risen Savior. In your name we pray. Amen. Won't you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Grief 
will make you do some strange things. Have you ever had the experience where you're going through some really tragic loss and the grief that you're experiencing makes you act in ways that you didn't expect? It's like when you lose someone so close to you and you begin to realize you can't really remember some parts of your life with them. You're surrounded by photographs of someone you've lost, but at the same time you can't seem to remember their face. Or you find yourself reacting in ways that other people might think are not how you should be acting. People think you should be sad and you keep laughing at memories. Or you keep crying even though you know the person you loved is in a better place. Grief makes us do strange things. Particularly if the person that we lost was unexpected or tragic in some ways. Someone who died too young. We begin then to try to bargain with God or with ourselves or think, what could we have done differently? Maybe we could have prevented this tragedy. We begin to blame ourselves. We begin to play that never-ending game of what if. Grief will make you do some strange things. This morning, we read a story in the Bible about three women who in their grief engage in some strange behavior and as a result are the first to see something the world had never seen before. It's a familiar passage, I'm sure, to many of you, but just in case, I want to read to you from the Gospel of Mark, the story of the first Easter Sunday. For Mark 16, hear these important words. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. These three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, are three women filled with grief. The past week had been a blur as they had seen Jesus enter Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna, the crowd welcoming Him with praise and glory and affirmation. And then just a few days later, many of those same people shouting out to crucify Him, calling for His death. These women had been of the few of His disciples, the ones to stay and watch what happened next. To see Jesus betrayed, arrested, beaten, 
and then put to death on a criminal's cross. They had watched as all the other disciples had fled and before it was all over and no one even knew what had happened, they were left to deal with the consequences. It was all over. All that they had hoped for. All that they had believed in. All that had been promised about who this Jesus was supposed to be. It was all gone. And all over. But in their grief, they come to do one final act of service to their beloved Master. You see, in the haste to bury Jesus before sundown on that Friday, before the Sabbath began, His body had been buried quickly in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, too quickly to finish the burial rites to fulfill the Jewish customs. And so these women took it upon themselves to finish the task. They had to wait until the Sabbath was over, the law that would have prevented them from working. Uh, Then they had to wait for the markets to open so they could go and buy spices for anointing his body. And then probably by that time had to wait for the next day because they wouldn't want to do this work at night too dangerous to go into a cemetery at night. And so they had waited to the sun had come up on Sunday morning to finish this important task. In Mark's gospel, he tells us that as they're walking to the cemetery, they keep asking each other, who's going to roll away the stone? It's an interesting question because these women had undoubtedly seen the large stone that probably took several men to roll in front of the tomb entrance. They had seen how large it was, how heavy it was, and how impossible it would have been for them to move the stone. And so they're talking to each other as they're walking. Who will move the stone? Who will move the stone? What do you think we're going to do about the stone? And yet they keep on walking anyway. Grief will make you do some strange things. And when they arrive at the tomb, they instantly notice something is wrong. That big stone they had been so worried about, it's rolled back. The door to the grave is open. And immediately, fear washes over them. You see, in the first century, grave robbing was a very common occurrence. Particularly if the grave was the grave of a wealthy person, as this grave was, belonging to Joseph of Arimathea. Grave robbers would rob because inside the grave would be fine linens, expensive clothes that they could steal and then sell for money. Or it could have been the work of someone trying to look for a souvenir of this would-be Messiah. Somebody wanting a, a token, a memento of this infamous Jesus. That would probably fetch a pretty shekel or two. Or maybe it was something even more sinister. Maybe the Jewish authorities had snuck in overnight and stolen the body of Jesus in order to prevent this from becoming a shrine to this false Messiah. In any event, the women are overcome with fear because whatever has happened is not good. Perhaps the robber is still in there. Maybe they've wandered into an active crime scene. Whatever's happened isn't good. And then what they do next is even more, um, here's that theological term, weird. They walk on in to the tomb. 
these women struck with fear, happening on a crime scene, perhaps a crime in progress, they keep on walking in. Yep. Grief will make you do some strange things. And at first, perhaps their fear is confirmed because when they walk in, they do find someone there, a young man dressed in white, sitting on the right side of the tomb. And clearly their faces gave him away because as soon as they walk in, the young man says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, aren't you? He's not here. He has been raised. And in that moment, these three grief-stricken women hear the words that will change the world. He's not here. He has been raised. These women realize what have happened. The one who was dead is now alive. The one they had lost is not really gone. The young man talking to them was not a grave robber. He was a divine messenger proclaiming to them the message that life isn't over. It's only just beginning. Now the young man then continues perhaps with a smirk on his face. Hey, look there. That's the place where they laid him. Empty. And isn't that just like Jesus? The Jesus that they knew? Never in the place you expect him to be. Always on the move. Never content to stay put. Jesus is never bound by people's expectations. The temple priest couldn't subdue him. Rome couldn't kill him. The grave could not hold him. And just when they thought that they had bound him forever, look, there's the place they put him. And he's not there anymore. Now the young man isn't done. He continues to tell the women, Go now and tell his disciples, Peter and the others, that he's gone ahead of them, back to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. It's interesting here that the young man brings up Peter to the women. Because the women haven't seen Peter in a couple of days. In fact, they haven't seen any of the disciples. They don't know where these guys are. Peter betrayed him. They even hear that Judas betrayed him. All of them denied him and fled. And yet here, in this moment of resurrection, the women are told that Peter and the other disciples get a second chance. They get to see Jesus again. And in that message, we hear the good news that Peter and the others have a new chapter. Their story isn't over. Just like Jesus' story isn't over. And the words of that messenger hold a promise to everyone that in the resurrection, we can have forgiveness and reconciliation and a new beginning. Our past doesn't have to define us. Our grief doesn't control us. Our guilt and our failures are not the last word. But then do you notice the women turn and leave. And we get a final, maybe yet again, unanticipated detail. 
Mark tells us that they fled for the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. It's here that Mark ends his Easter morning story. Now, eventually there are 12 other verses that we read in which we do hear that the women eventually tell Peter and the other disciples that Jesus is alive, but their first instinct is silence. In fact, Mark wants us to really understand it because the, the Greek here is actually, um, they said nothing to nobody, for they were afraid. What are they still afraid of? Now guilt, remember, will make you do some strange things. But they've just been told that Jesus is alive. They've been told that Jesus has been raised from the dead. So why are they still afraid? And why aren't they saying anything just yet? Maybe they're afraid that the disciples won't believe them. Oh, these women, uh, their grief has, has led them to, to think in a false hope. They're afraid that they'll be doubted or thought to be making it up. Maybe they're afraid that the temple authorities will accuse them of stealing the body and creating this hoax of Jesus rising from the dead. Maybe they're afraid the Romans will arrest them and put them to death to suppress this story. Maybe they're afraid that people will think them hysterical in their grief. Or maybe they're afraid for a completely different reason. What if they are afraid that it really is true? What if they're afraid that Jesus is who he says he is? Afraid that all the healings, all the miracles, all the teachings, all that talk about loving your neighbor and forgiving your enemy, maybe that's true. Maybe they're afraid that death is not the end. And afraid that, that there is something beyond what we see. Afraid that life really is eternal. They're afraid that God has come near and that they have seen God face to face in Jesus. They're afraid that if it's true, then we can never be the same. Because when the women realize that they have just heard an angel of the Lord declare to them the resurrection of Jesus Christ, their first reaction is probably the most sincere and appropriate reaction to that news. Silence. It's what some people call holy awe. Because how do you explain that one who was dead is now alive? How do you adequately express that information? You know, we've celebrated Easter perhaps so often and for those of us who grew up in the church, it's so normal. But friends, pause there for a moment and ask yourself, what would you say? How would you explain to someone who had never heard this that Jesus died, but now he is alive? kind of scary. And if I'm honest to you, I, I'm afraid sometimes about that. Because like Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and like Salome, those three women, 
I'm afraid that it's true. And that means a lot. Because if Jesus is raised, it means he is still alive. If Jesus is raised, it means I can't control him. If Jesus is raised, it means I really do have to love God with all that I am. And I have to love my neighbor as much as I love myself. If Jesus is raised, it does mean that life ends not in death, that life goes on. If Jesus is raised, it also means that how I live in this life matters. The decisions I make matter. If Jesus is raised, it means that I can share in His resurrection, but it also means that I might have to share in His suffering and in His cross. If Jesus is raised from the dead, it means that sins can be forgiven, but it also means that I have to forgive people. If Jesus is raised from the dead, it means that everyone can begin again. That everyone can be loved into life. If Jesus is raised from the dead, it means the world can never be the same. And I'm afraid that it also means that you and me can never be the same either. Like those three women, we have heard this good news and we can't ignore it. So what do we say when someone asks us what we did today on Easter? Well, we can tell them, or at least attempt to tell them, that Jesus is alive. And that he's hoping that each one of us will seek after that abundant and eternal life. Now this morning, I've tried to explain it to you. I've used words. We've used songs. In all these ways, we've tried to share the good news of what that angel told us. That even though we came looking out of our grief... We did not find his body, but we found a promise that he is raised and that that has changed the world. So, how do we explain what happened today? Well, I think maybe the best way, just for today, is to take the lead of these three women. To spend a few moments in holy awe. And that the most that we can say is perhaps silence. Not try to explain it not try to explain it away, not trying to make it make logical sense. Because grief will make you do some strange things. And the women will get around eventually to telling the story. But sometimes, sometimes, when confronted with the majesty of a risen Savior, the best thing that we can say is, Amen. Now friends, as you go forth, remember, Jesus is risen from the dead, and that changes the world. So go forth into that world, 
having been changed by this good news. And if you really allow it to wash over you, you don't have to worry about what to say. People will see the joy in your face. So go in that good news and remember, Jesus is alive. Amen.